And we are live, man. We are seat of the pants, <laughs> seat of the pants live Friday show on AI and enterprise video. I've been looking forward to this all week. Brent Leary, what's going on? I get to hang out with the bro hammer on his show. This is kind of cool, man. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. You're, you don't have to like run the show and think of what questions to ask <laughs> and all that crap. Uh, this is so, be fun. Yeah. Hey. Um. Why is enterprise video so damn boring? Um, well, actually, let's hold that question, but you are going to – I am going to ask you to answer that one, so just fair warning. Uh, just just for listeners to know what's going on today, I've been wanting to talk with Brent for a while about enterprise video and, and how it fits into content strategy. I'm going to do that later this summer with Brent and Paul, I think. But this kind of came up because – I've been spending a lot of time on looking at AI and video editing for very selfish reasons. I can't stand to edit videos. So I've done a bunch of demos and stuff, and I, I know Brent has strong views on that. So I want to talk to Brent about that, but I also want to show you all a little bit about what Brent's been up to on the road, because you might have seen him on LinkedIn with this cool studio setup, but man, you should see his road kit. <laughs> very cool. Brent, you can, you can put people in the chair in a variety of locations and get very good production values. I don't know how you do it, man. Well, the, the thing is, the, the fun thing is, uh, if you have some really good mobile equipment, you can pretty much set up anywhere. And, and you know, I, I don't like the kind of traditional you're in an office kind of setting or even at an event where you feel like you're just at a table and chair and, and you're, you're, you know, you can do that anywhere. What's really cool is having the right kind of equipment that can go anywhere you can find better locations. And I like to think if you can find more comfortable, more casual conversations to have these conversations, well, locations yeah. to have the conversations, you end up having better conversations. So that's kind of what I go for. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, Tracy's already bringing that up. She says, is it similar to my disillusion with stock art? How many pictures of smiling people looking at a laptop do we need? <laughs> right. So, so, oh, and she likes your next level camera too. So, oh, this is the she's... camera. This is the latest. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Tracy. It's the the latest in my collection. I mean, I've I don't even want to tell you how much I spent, but I'm just looking on my table here. Here's one. This is the box camera. Here's another one. This is the this one here is the Lumix Panasonic Lumix GH5. That was the very first camera I bought when I decided to. To kind of step up my game so that was like three years ago um and since that camera i probably got about 10 cameras man you know and i don't even want to tell you how much i spent but this last the one that i'm using right here this this one i just got in about a month ago this is the one i've been waiting for it's the latest from panasonic it's their s5 what makes this one really nice is the autofocus is so good that was the big, and I don't want to geek out too much. Tell me when you need me to stop. But uh, these are the things that I think about when <laughs> I want to be able to capture really good conversations. So I want to capture good images and good audio quality, right? Either when I'm you know doing this or out on the go. And so those are the things I look for. So thanks, Tracy. Yeah, this I'm loving this. Uh, this camera has been really good so far. It's the one I take on the road now because it's easy to travel with. It's very compact. You can buy lenses that are pretty compact. This lens is like this, like this big, uh, but it packs a while. It gives you a really good quality. So that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for now. Great quality, but easy to travel with. Yeah, she says she's got a lighting video camera sound girlfriend, and the color is so true. She's a geek, too. Yeah, we can <laughs> geek out a little bit on production here, and I, and I want to get into that a little bit more. In fact, I'm I've, I've been working on a hobby project to get my $1,500 Canon XA10 to communicate Ooh. with my laptop. Nice. I've not succeeded yet, but that's that's a whole other story. <laughs> but um, but I want to get back to Tracy's original point around the the stock art, smiling people, and stuff like that because you know um, we'll get into a little bit more in a bit on the problems with enterprise video. But Tracy, to your point, you know. Um, one of the reasons why I like Brent's work is that he does like to put people in a more informal vibe. And we'll get into that through, you probably saw some of his plays productions videos by now. seems like he's on LinkedIn shooting video, what, 50 times a week, <laughs> but they have a whole network. So I'm going to let Brett do a shameless plug about that at the end, what he and Paul are up to. But, 
but for now, what I wanted to just say is I think, yeah, that's what's cool about having such a portable kit is that you can kind of just set up, sit down and talk and, you know, and, and yet with the adequate attention to how things look and sound and, yeah. and that, and that matters, right? Because the, the advantage of the studio set in the past was that the portable kits just didn't look good enough and the Wi-Fi connectivity sucked and all this other stuff. But I think we're finally getting to the point now where people can do what you do. Like you have this backpack full of stuff and you set it up and run. Yeah. The other thing about the backpack full of stuff and the stuff that's in the backpack, things that I know I didn't consider when I first started going this, down this path, but it became painfully obvious. You want to be able to set up quickly. <laughs> You know, you don't want to have yeah. there, there's a million pieces that you could actually get stuck trying to piece together. And if you only have a certain amount of time, um, you can have the greatest stuff in the world. But if you don't have the time to set it up and make sure it works correctly, it's no good. So and and we're you know, I'm not a professional videographer. You know, my I'm, you know, an industry observer kind of person. Um, but I wanted to do quality conversations and, and create quality content so i learn i'm you know i'm still learning but you learn on the go and you you want to make sure you buy things that are easy for you to assemble in a short amount of time so that you can spend the most time with the people you're having the conversations with and sometimes you, you know that's one of those things that i never thought about up front but i have definitely learned because the first last year when we first kind of got back on the on the conference scene after the pandemic stuff, Paul Greenberg, you know, you mentioned Paul, it's Paul Greenberg, who of course most people know is the godfather of CRM. He's also my co-host on the CRM players. And, and we partnered on the players production network, but the first number of events, we events we went to last year, we would bring all this equipment and we hardly ever able were able to get it to work the way we wanted to because something went wrong or we didn't have enough time to really check. And so all these lessons that I kind of learned, you know, for the last year or so, year and a half or so, and I'm trying, I'm hope I'm hoping to share because it's things that you just don't think about when you first go down this path. But the key, like you said, is how do you create and have great discussions with people? you know, out there when you're at an event and you have limited time to get to them and you want to be able to have a great conversation and pull as much information and insight out of them without being weighed down with setting up a whole bunch of stuff. And then it doesn't work the right way. And then you're trying to tweak it and instead of focusing on the conversation. So those are things that, you know, lessons that I learned that I'm hoping that maybe some of the arrows I took, People don't have to take. Yeah, this and this we'll get into this a little more, but this another thing around why is enterprise video so so boring so damn boring. And one of one of the things I'll remember about this is doing a online production speaking and every rehearsal was more focused on the lighting and the sound and the setup. And and every conversation that we did during rehearsals got blander and blander. And then, and the best one was the first one when we were just winging it. And I was like, and by the time we got to the live version, it was so canned and the production values were a lot better, but the conversation itself had become so stilted. Yeah. And, um, and I felt like, man, we, we lost a lot more than we gained because so, cause the fact of the matter is that an enterprise video, the first tier is just, you have to get to the point where the production values are not a distraction, Right. Like you got to get there. The audio has got to be good enough, video good enough. If you're in a really loud place, then obviously you have to take that into account and try to do shorter stuff, you know, longer stuff. You need a little more quiet. But the point being like, that's the baseline. From there, you it, the way I see it, Brent, you tell me what you think. Then you start working your way up over time. You, first, you get the baseline right where stuff doesn't go wrong <laughs> and it streams right and it and it sounds good enough, it looks good enough. And then you start thinking about over time, fine tuning that, but without making it complicated. Yeah, I, I think the, the key to 
any video, regardless of its enterprise focus or just personal, you try to have fun. Good sound is as important as good uh, video quality image, because if the sound is jacked up, people aren't going to watch. I don't care how clear the image is or how interesting the conversation may be. If the sound is cracking and snapping and off, people aren't going to watch. So you, yeah, you do have those baselines. Get your sound right. Have a nice image quality. Um, make sure that you know, if you don't have uh, great sunlight, you don't want to be backlit. <laughs> you know, you want to make sure that everybody can see the faces of the individuals. Those are like table stakes. Right. But to your point, you have to have them because you don't want the any kind of any of those kind of distractions when you're actually sitting down for the conversation. And I completely agree with you about we I, I don't script stuff. Um, and I, you know, me and Paul, when we do the players, sometimes we we're inviting guests on and, you know, you have to work through PR or AAR or something like that. And the thing that we hate the most, and you probably run into this too, is when they ask for a set of questions up front. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, look, have you seen our show before? You know, we're not trying to do any gotcha stuff. We're really interested in learning more about the person and the subject matter. We're not trying to, you know, do gotcha stuff. And, you know, here's some themes, top line themes we, we may be covering. But no, we can't give you that because we don't know exactly what we're going to ask you. It depends on how the conversation is going. We right. It's organic. It's not scripted because who, how many people are out there like sitting there and just watching somebody read a script? I don't, you know, so. That's probably the number one issue with a lot of, you know, enterprise content. It's stiff. It's stilted. It's scripted. It doesn't seem to want to go where the conversation wants to organically go because you're too busy sticking to the script. And that yep. kind of ruins it. Yeah. So before we end this particular segment, I want to give folks a glimpse of a couple of your your shows and what you did. So I'm going to see how I do on my screen share here <laughs> see if Streamyard cooperates with me and then i gotta uh, yeah i gotta pick the that's not so helpful because i got like a zillion freaking things up let's see <laughs> uh sorry peeps totally winging it didn't rehearse this part why isn't it showing that's my photos right. we're free we're free oh, i think i might have a photo on this one okay let's try this one then so, oh yeah do that we have was... a photo of that is that yeah showing yeah, I'm seeing it. Okay, that, cool. that was uh, just a couple of weeks ago at Genesis Experience in Denver. At uh, I think they were at that really nice uh, Gaylord Center there. And and as you can see, I'm sitting. We're outside, very casual. Uh, that with me is uh, Brett. What is Brett's last name? We Brett Weiger Weigel. He's uh, an SVP and GM over at Genesis. And what I wanted to do, because I've I've known Brett since his days at Salesforce, always had good conversations, and, and I wanted us to be casual. I wanted us to not be, you know, in that structured environment of the conference. And we right. were able to come outside. They actually, you, you can't see it because it's kind of the the shot is kind of tight. But people are out there playing cornhole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like a, it was like I said it was like a quad. Like you used to go, you know, you're when you go to college and you're a kid, you're hanging out in the quad. That's the setup that they actually have for this conference. So inside, everything is very structured. Outside, people are walking around playing cornhole, you know, mm -hmm. sitting out eating lunch. And so that's the I, I that's the setup, you know, I decided to go with. And, you know, Brett was game for it. And and that little camera and I got a little lavware mic set up. Very lightweight, very easy to, to put together, but it got, I'm getting this, the image that you see here is that's the image that we got for that shot and it, it very little effort. It didn't take a lot of time to set up and it allowed us to focus on the conversation. And at that particular time, I think he was giving me the business because he's a San Francisco 49ers fan. I'm a Rams uh, fan. Right. Yeah. That, that'll create some on air tension for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long did that take to set up that? That's set there. Oh, uh, that. So I think I, it took me about 10, 15 minutes. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I got out there a little ahead of the time. So you moved the chairs around, scouted out a nice uh, piece of uh, real estate, set the camera up on the tripod and it, it, and all that stuff. It's not only easy to set up the total combined weight of the camera and the tripod. And I think everything else may be about six pounds. So it's very lightweight, very easy to put in a bag and travel with and very easy to set up. Those are the things that you don't really think about when you first start going down this path. But as soon as you start hitting the road, it becomes very obvious that you want to do, work with that. Yeah, uh, the vibe of that shoot looks so good. And it just makes you think, yeah, that probably was a pretty relaxed, interesting conversation because it's hard not to feel relaxed when you're when you're watching people play cornhole. <laughs> um Tracy says, uh, sorry to hijack you, but that's fine. That's sort of the point of the show. Do you think it would be worth the cost of having a photo come in and take pictures of my actual in real life office to use on my site? Potentially, Stacy, especially if you have a nice setup in there. Um, I think it's good. I think people like to see behind the scenes like that. Yeah. I always think about like the director's cut, right? Show people a little bit of how the sausage is made is they like. Yeah. Well, what, what was interesting is that picture was actually taken by one of uh, Genesis's Genesis's, I guess that's how you say it, AR folks um, who was just watching, you know, AR, they like to see what's going on, what's being said in the conversation. She just pulled out her camera, started taking pictures. Then she sent it to me. I was like, oh, that's really cool. So it was nice to see that. And, and like you, uh, I think like it's being said here, people like to see the behind the scenes. I, some, you know, when I rearrange my <laughs> studio, I try to take pictures before and after um, so that people can kind of get a sense of what what it takes to do, you know, what they actually see in a live stream or or at a on location event. So, yeah, totally makes sense. All right. So, Tracy, I want to answer your other question on multitasking because I want to also show you some shots. I took a Brent's. Uh, gear which i have finally found some good ones here uh tracy you say you can't expect non-actors to follow a script and make it feel natural yeah for sure and and also to be honest with you like and this goes back to b2b and enterprise video I, i talk a lot about the importance of just the value of just having experts and and people who know their shit just talking informally it's highly valuable but also there is an inter- entertainment value. And I think the entertainment value in B2B, a lot of it comes out of the surprise factor. And like that feeling that, hey, I don't know what these two guys are going to say next. Like that's sort of interesting in our industry. I know it's sort of embarrassing that that would be interesting, but it is <laughs> because so often that's not the case in our world. You so know, setting that tone, which I think you all do on your show which is, yeah, people might not like every segment, but what they do know is they don't know exactly what's coming. Yeah. And I think the other uh, component that has become increasingly more important, particularly if you're doing like shows like this, is what being able to incorporate Tracy into the, to the conversation. Right. You know, because as we talk, you know, you have questions, I have questions, we both have perspectives, but bringing in the voice of the the folks that are, are checking it out because they add another piece to the puzzle and it becomes, it doesn't become like a passive show for them. It becomes an interactive engagement. And that's part of why we should be doing these things is, you know, I might have some good questions, but there are probably even better questions that are coming from folks that are watching that. Oh, well, why didn't I think of that? And then I'm able to bring that in. To the person and the and, and the person that I'm typically talking with, and we're having this conversation, they love when somebody is listening and and adds to the conversation and in something that maybe neither of us have thought about, right? So I think that's the most one of the more compelling aspects of what we're doing with video is it becomes a team sport and not some sort of passive, you know, activity for folks. Exactly. Okay, so I'm going to switch over, see how this goes. I'm going to start <laughs> with a photo of – this is this is That's your bad. gear backpack. This, this is from – I took this in Chicago. So this is actually – this goes in as a carry-on. 
Yep. And um, it's not the lightest backpack of all time. I, I lifted it, but it's carry on. So this is your whole gear. And I'm about to show what it looks like when yep. it's set up. But that's that's the portable factor here. There it is again. I had to get a couple of nice shots of your gear. And here we are. <laughs> uh, so not not the most flattering photos. Let's see if we have, <laughs> find a better one. Oh, there we go. Engaged in conversation. There it is. Um, this one, the one I wanted to show had a better close up of the gear itself, but I think we're going to have to settle for this unless maybe I can see if I can blow it up just a little bit. Yeah. So while you're doing that, all the, all the stuff that you see on that table was actually in that bag. So yeah, so that bag all fit. Yeah. That bag contained my MacBook. That's a 16 inch uh, MacBook pro that little uh, black device right in front of it is called an ATEM mini. That's a video switcher. That is what allows me to use these professional level cameras and have it connected at, as a webcam to the MacBook Pro. And that little device there is probably the foundational piece of how I actually got started doing video because I could I could connect up the four uh, cameras to that one little box there. And by pressing buttons, I can go back and forth between different camera views. So the laptop, the ATEM Mini, the little black device that's in front of the ATEM Mini is an audio recorder. That's the Tascam uh, audio recorder. That allows me to connect professional mics to my broadcast. So I'm, each of us are, are wearing lav mics. Those lav mics are XLR connected to that device. That device is connected via USB-C to my laptop. And that then that acts as the audio source that's coming in. The video source is coming in from that A10 Mini device. And then off to the right there is the actual camera. That's the same camera that I'm using right now on that very little mini desktop tripod. Yep. All of the things that you're seeing were in that bag. And it makes it very easy for me to carry it around. Absolutely. Yeah, that's 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 a really high quality setup. And in this case, you weren't streaming, right? But you you could have, like, you could stream with this setup. Yeah, this one I was recording. Right. Uh, but the only reason that I recorded is because we weren't uh, sure we were going to be able to pull this off. So I didn't right. want to put it out there that, hey, we're going to be streaming. So I recorded it. I, I recorded a couple of conversations right from there. And by the way, uh, yeah, and yeah, we were plugged in, so we were definitely using power. But when I was outside, everything was running on batteries. That's the other thing. Right. So if you're able to, you want to be able to run as much on battery because that uh, lifts the restrictions that you have on where you can actually do stuff. If you have uh, enough battery power, the ca the power of the camera, sometimes the lights, then you can go pretty much anywhere and set up. But if you're Sometimes you're limited and sometimes you want it, you, you need, you have too many things that need power that you just have to plug in and you do what you need to do for that. But if I'm always, I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I, I, if I want, if there's like the perfect setup location, I want to be able to use that. And if I don't need the power, if I need to bring everything to get right. that location, I'm going to do it at this point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, when, Back when Dan Hallett and I had our full studio, we um, we lugged so much gear, mm -hmm. and I got I I've, I still have a gear hangover from those <laughs> years, so I I I need to have an even lighter setup, so I make a few sacrifices, but I I can still do some pretty cool stuff with yeah. almost no weight. I I had to go even lighter than you, so it's all about like tolerance level for gear plus your other stuff, and you know and how whether you want to check a bag or not, you have to kind of find your comfort level with all those things. Yeah. You found a way to do it without checking a bag, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Well, uh, what I do though, no, I, I still, I bring it, I check a bag when I had, when I bring um, my tripods because. Right. You know, I the tripods look, are just big. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, 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 yeah. So, and I might, I might need two tripods, but luckily I, they're very lightweight and they shrink down so that they fit easily. And like uh, I have one of those, um, I forget one of those, one of those bags. It's not very big, you know, like hard case, hard shell, about twenty-two inches. 
it, it could fit at an overhead, but sometimes I just don't want to lug a bunch of stuff through the airport. So I'll, I'll check the bag, but I can put a couple of tripods in there and my clothes and some cords. You know, sometimes I just I just throw all of the cables and yep. cords in that bag so I don't have to walk around because those things add up. <laughs> the weight of the cable oh, for sure. And and battery. Well, you 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 can't put you know those chargeable batteries in there, but you know plug-in batteries you can put in. So yeah, it, once again, it's all about how do you strategically uh, carry this stuff around in a way that doesn't kill your back, and it's it's relatively easy. Um, and so that's that's really the name of the game for me right now is just that. How do how do I do as much as I I need to without bring in like 50 pounds worth of stuff bingo i stopped on that picture because i like that was my favorite it's like yeah we're we're badasses <laughs> and stop taking photos of us so we can do our thing yeah so. by the way that's jay wilder who is one of those uh svps over at salesforce i think he's on the marketing marketing cloud side of the house so we were talking about marketing gpt there, there you go <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah, she's talking about the office setup. Yeah, you know, actually, I'm do, I'm doing in my office. I'm doing. I've got this old school five point lighting. I'm gonna like get someone in there to like set up a five point lighting just for kicks. But to your point, Tracy, like you got to think through that stuff because I wouldn't do that in my home office environment because setting that up and putting it down all the time. But in my office, I can just leave it up. So that's what I'm gonna probably do. But um, but yeah, and that's part of it too. Is you've got to have your these days you want to be hybrid, right? You want to have your road thing and you want to have your, your, your off the road thing. And you want to be able to do cool stuff either way. So that's one of the things you and Paula thought through, I think pretty well. And even you've even schooled up some newbies, some of your hosts without deep video experience and stuff, but that's, we can get into that a little more another time. And then Tracy says she remembers the days of schlepping three laptops. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, and, and back in the day, the other issue then Howard and I had is that going streaming live back in the day was precarious. It, it, the TriCaster had all these complex configurations yeah. and then Tri the Wi-Fi was always threatening to go down and even the hard lines weren't always perfect. And of course we demanded hard lines whenever possible and yes. made a lot of friends with our <laughs> hosts by, by demanding that stuff. Anyhow, I just bring that up just as that's one more consideration to think about as you bring your gear portable is, is it the Wi-Fi connectivity and the landline versus the streaming is something you still, that's one thing you still have to think about a little bit yeah. and just have backup plans in mind. And I'm sure Brent will have a comment on this in a moment, but that's one reason why I sometimes just tape the old school podcast audio. It shows is because if I'm at all concerned about something around the streaming tech, then sometimes I just like to go old school. Yeah, it's good to, to almost have a like a, a copy duplicate yeah. thing going on. So, uh, and I've learned the hard way from this too. Like you know, um, sometimes, like you said, the stream doesn't work. Uh, so you're thinking everything's going great, and people are commenting can't hear you you like you keep freezing up and it's like, oh shoot so uh what we decided to start doing is making sure that we're able to record locally even if the the live stream isn't working so that um right. we can at least put it up after the fact without all that stuff so your your auto recorder that can record on the device uh your video your camera can record on the device, uh, StreamYard the service we're using now, it allows you to record locally. So, right. you know, even though you, the bandwidth might be cutting out and things look choppy during the actual broadcast, everything is recorded locally. So you can actually piece it together at least after the fact. That's a huge way of saving face if you promise someone a live stream and you can at least say, hey, live stream fell apart sorry about that not our fault but hey we got the live we got the local recording we can do something with this so that was a learning experience from last yeah. year too. <laughs> and and that's not solved yet i just wanted to point that out and mm -hmm. and even if you have a direct internet connect which helps a lot it doesn't necessarily guarantee so you want to have your fallback plan if you're if you're doing the live stream that's all
by the way, so, most of the vendors now realize how important it is to uh, let folks like us do these things now. And for the most part, if you're if you kind of let them know ahead of time, you can you can get them to, to put that into their plan. Right. And we're seeing it happen more and more. So put in that land cord is really a nice, nice touch. Yep. Oh, and by the way, just make sure your gear supports that because a lot of modern laptops don't have a, a, a LAN thing without an adapter. So just wanted to mention that real quick since we're gearing out. Yeah. Oh, by moment. the way, the camera I use here, you can actually, you don't even need a laptop. It can stream directly to the. Direct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I want to. I want to shift gears. I did want to mention briefly, and I'll maybe we'll pick up on this if I get you and Paul back later. But you also took over the stage at I think it was Varen, right? That's pretty cool. So, yeah. and, and I, th I think that's sort of the power of of this format. You know that it engages people enough that hey, you know Brent and Paul are on stage taking over the show. That's pretty cool. So, well, don't well, have a photo well, of that to show you today yeah. because see two seat of the pants. But it was really neat <laughs> to see that on LinkedIn. But but the coolest thing about it is they, they you know Varent we we both have known folks that have been there for a, a long time they're familiar with the show they're familiar with how we operate and so that was the coolest thing was trusting us to basically do what we do and and have a show right from the like their main keynote stage where we're basically just having conversations with a, a number of their executives. And uh, it was great because I think it allows for uh, executives to be shown in a much broader perspective. Like we weren't just talking strictly about the product or, you know, what their roadmap is or all that. We were, you know, we were intrigued by, you know, one of the guys, uh, the, the chief product officer. Um, he's a big cat guy. So him and Paul are talking about cats. And uh, one of their other VPs, uh, Daniel Ziv, he he is a, a big wine connoisseur. So Paul and uh, you know they're talking about that. So being able to intermix personal and professional in a casual environment, yeah. um, I think you know people are starting to say, well, you know, we can do that. And then the last part of that is, yeah, it's two hours. Nobody expects people to watch uh, a, a significant amount of people to watch the whole thing. But the coolest part of this. And this is part of what you're doing with the AI video stuff. It, you're able to chop that thing up in so many ways and get nuggets that are, you know, talking about specific things in a 90 second, two minute period. People love that. People love being able to just watch that. And then if they're intrigued enough, they'll go and watch the whole thing. But it yep. takes that little nugget for them to, to feel like, OK, now I can go in and check it out. By the way, Alan says love to see Brent on the other side of the mic. So he's he's liking the hot seat vibe there. <laughs> that figures so, he likes to see me on the hot seat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and by the way, that question, folks, at the beginning when I asked Brent, why is enterprise video so damn boring? I think we've kind of come a long way towards answering that already. So I'm going to revisit that at the end of our discussion because that's kind of the sizzle question of the day um, but I think there's been a lot of clues dropped already on how to improve upon the sad state of affairs of the <laughs> overproduced b2b content that we have to schlock through all the time um, Alan, you know what it is though can I try I mean I, yeah. I think it's because uh, there's a need for folks to feel like they're in control of the content yep and because of that, they don't they don't trust the people in front of the camera to deliver compelling, interesting, uh, on point content. They feel like they have to try to guide it. And the best part of these conversations are the organic parts you, you, that aren't guided. They just come out from the give and take, the normal interaction. And that's something that I, I hope more vendors kind of try to understand because that's really the key to not th these things not being boring is letting people just talk and get to things, you know, as they come and, and, and being able to take what happens 
and then make something out of it afterwards sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that. Alan says control is not a tenet of good corporate narrative and storytelling. Oh, he fact, know. He's a, he's fact, a yeah. Guy. And he's, if you do a search on Alan and narrative, you will see. Alan, by the way, you're in my, you're in my D book that I send you that. I, I talked about narrative for a little bit and mentioned to you. Uh, Tracy Webster, don't forget on brand. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and so I don't want to get into too much detail on this because I want to get into AI and video editing before we wrap. But one, one thing I will say is that the sad thing about thinking you can control the messaging is that you absolutely cannot control that anymore. So right. that's part of the problem. And that's the whole thesis behind the so-called informed buyer. But basically, propaganda only works if you control all channels. <laughs> so... And, and I'm not saying that everything vendors want to do is propaganda, but you can learn from propaganda in terms of how minds work, how the human brain works. And the point is, you can't control the channels anymore. So the messaging, stay on message, does not work. And it is just amazing how many folks involved in marketing still don't understand this. But, you know, the numbers don't lie. You know, people like engaging interactive content it's just simple you know so absolutely so and and the, the good news is that once you move beyond some of that you can really surprise yourself because what when when vendors get defensive with me about this like one thing i tell them is like you got a lot of the right people you got a lot of the right voices you just need to set them free a little bit it's not they they get self-conscious because they think i'm saying they don't have anything to say but that, i'm not saying that at all I'm just saying we need to change how we say it. You yeah. got the you got great people and you got awesome customer voices in the mix too. Let's bring them in. But let's change the format around and quit overmanaging everything. And even yeah. if you if you're unsure, you know, that that can we do this? You can it, as easy as part of your conference. Just spare a little time and space to record something. It doesn't have to go live. Just record go. it and see what comes out of it and then use it. If it's good, go to the uh, you back to the drawing board if it's not. But you got to try. You got to do some things before uh, you don't want to just stick to the, the script that people. I mean, one of the things we've been talking about you know, is we just finished the first half of the conference year and there are certain things that we are just repetitive themes that we kept seeing. And we we're like, why are we seeing this? <laughs> you know, haven't you learned anything over the four or five mm -hmm. years that we, you know, pre, pre pandemic to now? Uh, Cause it felt like a lot of things that were in the pre pandemic event playbook just got carried over to the post pandemic playbook when it comes yep. to this stuff. And why? Because there were three years of really significant things that took place and how we take in uh, content virtually that should be a part of the post-pandemic uh, playbook. We haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah, yeah. Brent, I got to get the applause meter on that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, sound effects. All right. Yeah, that's... Man, that that's right you're right there man absolutely that's you're preaching to my choir man they're singing they're singing <laughs> that tune absolutely yeah yeah like this this whole thing why go back we want to just go back to how it was it's like well that's not how the world works but we can be creative we can learn like we can apply yeah. these lessons and was there anything in particular because i didn't get to that you did a really cool event wrap show i didn't get to that was there anything in particular that really jumped out as far as like things that need to change that you said why are we going back to this yeah well and I, i'm not going to call out any particular sure know, vendor or anything but one of the first events that we went to this year um very surprised that the vendor and it was the first time that they did a their live big event since 2019 uh, so we, we were like, oh, this, this is going to really be interesting because these folks, they used to do real, they, you know, before they did really creative stuff. Um, so we were expecting a lot. We go there, the keynote, I swear, I think it wasn't from 2019. It was from like 2001, a space odyssey or something. It was that it, it felt like, you know, everything went virtual. Everything got tighter, crisper, faster moving. You know, keynotes were like 
shortened and condensed. They integrated different components to it. They kept it moving quick. Right. First return, it went right back to like the 45 minute hour monologue. And we were like, what is going on? Yeah. That was the biggest thing. I was like, oh, come on. Got it. We've yeah. learned so many things. You know what people's attention has been morphed you know, from because our, our behaviors have changed because when we were sitting home virtual, we had like eight screens and we were looking up different things. And if something didn't catch our attention, we just turned our head and we were able to see a whole yeah. bunch of other stuff. They didn't take that into consideration. It went right back to we've got a captive audience and you're going to watch us our 60 minute yeah. drill down. You know, whether you like it or not, it was it was it was an eye opener. Let's put it like that. So catch catch the CRM players spring of uh, event rehash. I handed out some letter grades in my own little monologue on that, and some of them were F's. <laughs> um, which which gets to the AI for video video editing use case. I've been spending a lot of time on generative AI, as most of us have, because we really have no choice but to dig into this <laughs> right. before it runs us over like like a train. <laughs> um, but um, but I think there's some really interesting stuff around around enterprise use cases AI for video editing, and here here's why. Because so we do a live show like this, which you know if if you're watching and you're posting questions, then it's really engaging and that's cool. And that the goal of the live thing, in my view, is to make it as interesting as possible. But on replay, it's a little bit different because on replay you don't have that engagement factor anymore. And so if someone watches this whole thing on replay, like it's because they have a passion for video stuff or else they're relatives of you or me. <laughs> um, those that's the replay audience, right? Or they're Alan for, for if they're going to watch the entire thing. And, and, and that's a, that's a classic sort of enterprise dilemma, right? Because there's a lot of longer form content that gets recorded, you know, webinars, um, longer presentations, shows like this. And so then you have this inventory of footage. And and then and then what do you do with that? And now I do a couple things. Like, for example, I have a nice audio listenership because I started podcasting in 2007. I was an early adopter. I used to take that shit on phone lines. <laughs> so I got an audience there. So that's cool because the podcast audience likes the longer stuff a lot of times. In fact, they complained to me if I edit it down. They're like, I want longer stuff because, you know, they're hanging out in airports, listening, they're walking around, they're waiting in line at the grocery store. They like the longer stuff. But video is different, right? Because you're asking people to sit and watch. And we all know that shorter clips have impact. But you're someone who's fairly patient and I think doesn't mind doing video editing all that much. I Correct me if I'm wrong. I hate it. <laughs> I, I I absolutely hate video editing. I don't want to do it. You know what? And so that's one problem. So we'll, I will get to that in a sec. And then the other thing is outsourcing that is very tricky. Like outsourcing to a human, even if they're really good video editor, they may not really know the content enough to know what the key parts are. And then churning that around quickly. And then, and then there's costs involved. This is a prime AI use case, right? I mean, it, uh, it feels that way to me. What 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 what's your thing on video editing? Are, do you feel that you're efficient with that, or do you want do you want some help from AI here? So this is so interesting because back when uh, blogging, you know, uh, I think I started blogging or writing online articles. with <laughs> bring back nice uh, like 2003, um, and I, I you know I wrote for a couple of different outlets. Writing was cool. But you can only write so much. You had all these ideas flowing in your head and you couldn't get them down on paper fast enough before they got overtaken by other things. I started thinking, well, video might be the one of the ways that allows me to get more things out of my head and in front of an audience because it, it was like, oh, all you have to do is turn on the camera and talk, you know? And what I've realized, the more video I've done, uh, the more video editing becomes very important. And although there are certain things I like about video editing, one of the things is it really allows me to fully in immerse myself in the content and truly understand 
what's going on. Cause sometimes when you're in the midst of the conversation, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're, you're going back and forth. You're reacting to the first thing you watch that replay. And then you pick up on a whole bunch of other things that makes you feel like now you, you have a better understanding of what, whatever the thought or subject that was being talked about in addition to the person you were talking about it with. And then you're able to say, wow, I should pull out this piece because this mm-hmm. on its own is gold. It'll stand on its own. And, and that makes that's a good editing editor feeling. But the problem has become as you do more video, there's more that you have to take in, which means more time. And it takes time to really figure out what need, what that 30 second minute clip should be. And sometimes those, that 30 second minute clip, it's not just start and 30 seconds and, and they're done. A lot of times, prime example is last week's show when we were talking about the conference season, we had all these great folks on, you know, Liz Miller, Don Flukinger, uh, Rebecca Wetterman, uh, Mark Stiving, of course, Paul and I, and we were just talking about this stuff. And a lot of really cool things came out of it. It was like a 50 minute conversation that came, that really nailed down the conference season, but not everybody's going to want to watch 50 minutes of this. So I had to try to figure out how can I, take some of the best pieces of that 50 minute conversation and fit it into 20, uh, two minutes, because that's like the the limits you're pushing for people's uh, attention span. And I was able to do it. But then I was talking, you know, I heard feedback back from Alan and some other folks was like, you know, there was this one seg thing where you guys named five key things that you see Mm -hmm. in every event. And that was great. So I was like, okay, so then I basically condensed that two minutes to 28 seconds of just that and put it out on its own. So when you think about that, 50 minutes to two and then two minutes to 28, that took a lot of time <laughs> for me to do, but it was it was worth it. But th- and then there's so many ways you can slice and dice all this content. Right. You just can't do it all. So I like right. some of the video ed- editing stuff, but I can't I can't. I can't do right. it all because I got so many other things to do like you. Yeah. So you need help. And I'm glad you're talking about this AI video editing stuff. This is important. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll get to that. And Alan says that skill, finding what else is in the content besides what you're shooting for, that's hard and that's gold for sure. So I think we've established that even someone like yourself, Brent, that, that I would say sees more, derives more inherent value from the editing process than I do. You have a threshold there, a labor threshold you would love to get addressed. I'm in a situation where I can't go back to my digitonomic colleagues and say, hey, sorry, my blog's not ready for Monday, but I spent the weekend fussing around with clips. They, they, they'll they smack me upside the head. They don't want to hear about that. Phil, was so, flat. I can't imagine Phil slapping you upside the head. Man. Yeah, well, Stuart could. Um, but. <laughs> But but anyhow, the point being like like I, I for me, I can't be I can't be spending the weekend in the editing suit. And also, like I said, I don't enjoy that work at all. So what I have been doing is looking at different tools. And I think what's really fascinating about this is I have a concept that I use a lot called the AI overreach. And what it is, is when you overestimate what AI is capable of doing and this generation of AI based on deep learning actually doesn't understand language the way humans do. And I, I, th- I think a lot of people forget that a lot of the time. But when you play around with use cases, you're quickly reminded of that again. And so the challenge for AI for video editing in a nutshell is how do you make it more efficient for the user, but not do the overreach where you take too much control away? So let me tell you about a few tools I've been looking at. And Brent, if you have any you've been looking at, you can add in. There's one in mind that I think you would actually really like. By the way, I none of these vendors have given me any money. So there's no incentive for me financially. I just want to I want to put more cool stuff out there with very little effort. <laughs> now, now I do have I did make a little intro outro. So that's done. You know, so 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 that part I have. Um so, okay, so what, what I did is I tried a tool called detail.ai. Hmm. And what detail does, 
is, is I consider a little bit of the AI overreach model. Because what they do, I uploaded my conference video review where I hand out those letter grades. And they, they went through and their AI picked like eight clips that they said were the best clips. And they were really? all like around 30 seconds long. Nice. And one of them actually I thought was pretty good. It was when I gave out an F for vendors like uh, overemphasizing generative AI at the expense of things that customers can actually use right now. So I gave out an F for that. <laughs> and they had a really nice clip of that. And so it, it wasn't quite what I wanted because I wanted my intro outro, but but you know, I actually use Vimeo online for that. So I just loaded that 30 second clip up, slapped in the intro outro, downloaded that, and I was done in like five minutes. Nice. And and that was up and running and that was cool. Let me yeah. let me stop you. You just asked a quick question. So you said it came up with eight. How many of them were do you think were usable that that really hit the mark for you? Well, the good news was that almost all of them were were good clips in the sense that they weren't like capturing me in mid sentence or something, you know, something nonsensical. So they were mostly good clips, but I mostly disagreed with the AI's sense of what the most important moments were. And and there were a few others that I probably could have used and and shared that were okay. They weren't bad, but it's a little bit to your point around talking with Alan where it's like Oh yeah, that was really cool. And with that particular service at the moment, and and of course these services are subject to change over time, um, because a lot of them are still in their infancy in a lot of ways. This service sort of makes that decision for you. Mm. So would I use it in the future? Yeah, because pretty easy. Get get eight clips that just need a little top and tail. And if one or two or three are on the mark, then I've got quick clips that are ready to go. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would use it in the future, but I would not say, I would say it was a little more shot in the dark in terms of what was, what was really important. And I don't know how they necessarily pick that with the AI. It's possible that they listen a little bit to the volume and tone of the speakers. I don't know, but anyway, so that's that service. Then there's one called wise cut and I'm not, I'm forgetting the actual URL, uh, wise cut video. Wisecut.video is interesting because wisecut.video is is very user friendly interface. I would say, though there were a couple of issues accessing some project files, but in general, like you have that easy to use interface. And what what it did is I loaded up that thirty four minute thing, and then in there it allowed me to basically pick different segments with a check mark, and then I could quickly combine those segments, which was pretty cool. So, and that was the one I ended up posting on uh, LinkedIn that was about three and a half minute long review where I went into some stuff around the highs and lows of conference season and mostly about why events need to be more interactive and why vendors are screwing that up. It was, I, I mentioned insufferable keynotes to your point around keynotes, <laughs> but, um, but the thing I really liked about it was how user-friendly and how fast it was for me to just pick a few different, because what I did is I kind of walked. Uh, like my video show, like, like a lot of shows, I think yours is similar, can hop back and forth to different topics a bit. Yeah. And, and, and so when you want to do like a little bit of a highlight thing, you want to pick some different clips and it was pretty easy to combine that and then, and then pull it out. Um, it supposedly has intro outro functionality, but I struggled with that part. Uh, but, um, the, the problem I have with it is that the transitions weren't too smooth. And I, it, and what I wanted to do was take the end of one scene and add it to the next one because the AI didn't do a terrific job of identifying exactly when subjects changed. And I wanted a little more mi- ability to flex that. And I, and they said in fee- in response to me, they said that they're aware of that issue and are supposedly working on it. The third tool I wanted to mention, because I think you would find this particularly interesting, is Pictory.ai. And I, I actually know one of the founders, Vikram Chalana, if we go way back. And so I have a little bit of an edge there in terms of getting support. Nice. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to put that out there um, because getting support for some of these tools can be a little tough at times. Mm. Um, Pictory does a few different things. They have This isn't their only use case because they also do like text to... Uh, video using generative AI, but they have a they have a video editing interface. This is what you may find interesting, Brent. That's based on editing a transcript. So you edit the transcript to get the video you want. 
Nice. The the downside to their tool is that it takes a little bit more. I would say the user interface is a little more complicated, but you can set up your template for your intro outro. And there's a couple things you can do. One thing you can do is you can pick a handful of quotes from the video and create a highlight video quickly of just those quotes. Nice. And and so what I like about this is it doesn't have the AI overreach factor because they're not allowing the AI to make those decisions for you. Where the AI comes in is first to keep, provide you with that inline transcript. So you can do that. And then the other thing you can do if you want is you can work within the transcript editor. So instead of pulling highlights out, you can just cut down the transcript. So you could pick three parts of the transcript and, and do it that way. Either way, you customize your video. But the idea being like when you describe that thing where picking like your top five things from a video, that would work really well here because you could just highlight those, pop them in, and then put, and then quickly customize and download the video. To me, that's a pretty significant time saver. Now, they also have an AI component where you can ask the AI to create a video for you. And I haven't experimented with that very much, but what you can do is you can specify about how long you want the video to be based on what you uploaded. And then that will dictate how much the AI does. And I tried it and I thought it was interesting because it wasn't very coherent, but um, it's, it, it was good in terms of like, it got all the sentences right. didn't catch me in mid sentence, but when you watched it, you're like, what is that? That guy has a problem. Like he skips, <laughs> skips around to different topics and stuff. But the cool thing is they don't force you to use that. So you can use that if you want, see what it comes up with. But you can also just do it yourself. But I really like transcript transcript based video editing as a concept because I much prefer that to trying to like do the markers in the video and split the segments <laughs> up and that kind of stuff makes me crazy. And you might like it too, Brent, in the sense that you you like reviewing the content when you're when you're editing. So this might save you the time, but also still allow you to go through the transcript and make discoveries around topics. So anyway, I think it's interesting to kind of just think about different approaches. And I don't know if you've tried other ones too, but but I think it's an interesting area. And I think there's 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 gonna be a way to to get the most out of what AI can do, but also not pull people like you and me totally out of the loop where we want to make some content editing decisions as well. I mean, I, I, right now I use, you know, Adobe creative cloud and they're really starting to fuse a lot of the AI stuff, gen AI stuff, and just, you know, regular AI into uh, their tools. So one of the things about um, Adobe premiere pro is that they have a, a, a function now that creates transcriptions and traits and creates captions. Right. And I have to say their the accuracy on their transcription is, unbelievable um and so some of the things i have started doing is um you know getting it transcribed and then just looking through the transcript and, and then it's time stamped and you know saying well let me just see if i can go right to this and make something here because our shows are anywhere from you know it could be 30 minutes to an hour and right some shows i'm not directly involved in on with players production network so I, I might not see it when it airs. So that means I do I really want to watch 60 minutes of video every you know week for one show? No. Um, I really I can't afford to like you. So getting a transcript made and allows you to kind of skim is is already say you know a pretty significant time saving. But I'm yeah, looking for yeah, more yeah. of that kind of stuff. You know, I, I I would love to be able to have a tool that, you know, and I know YouTube has has been doing this for a while, you know, finding what they call the significant moments uh, in, in a video. I would love to find that. But the problem, and I think you touched on it, and I'm probably going to have to go because I got to do another show. Um, oh, yeah, you got your five o'clock, right? Yeah. 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 The, the, the problem is I have not been able to trust that is pulling the stuff that I would pull. Right. That's the issue. The subject matter expertise, whether it's AI right now or another human, I'm not comfortable right. turning that over to that right now. And so that's yeah, and that's and that's what I call the AI overreach, where you shouldn't give too much trust that the AI is going to find this stuff, find the right balance 
design it in such a way that it pulls the good stuff, but allows you to modify it where you need to or pick other good stuff. And now you're on to something. I think this is a fruitful area. So we're going to have to revisit it when we have had more time to play around with some of this stuff. Brent, I know you got to go to your next show, so we can't give you time for your play as production full plug, but let's just say that Brent and Paul are putting on a lot of shows. So check out <laughs> players production network on YouTube. We'll have them back to discuss that more later. Thanks for joining. Thanks for showing off your gear and on to your next. Thank you, sir. Bro hammer. Indeed. Although I didn't do a lot of hammering because I was in the host here, but that's fun too. So <laughs> catch you later, man. Thanks, man. See you. See you. Brent Leary in the art of enterprise video. It's always great to learn from those who have done it. And Brent has done more to get me on the air than anyone else. Uh, when I rebooted my show, I used to uh, tape Google Hangouts uh, and that was my first experience with uh, enterprise video, which was like pretty fun back in the day. But, uh, but anywho, uh, is there any other uh, quick comments from the peanut gallery before we wrap up? I hope you enjoyed that deep dive. I think that's going to be a fun one to, uh, for me to chop up a little bit because there are definitely some different segments in that one. So uh, thanks especially to Ellen and Tracy to keep things interesting in the chat. Much appreciated. And uh, Alan, I want to get back real quick to your final thing here. That skill, finding what else in the content besides what you were shooting for, that's hard and that's gold. I think that's a really key takeaway. And as we evaluate these next generation tools, that's something we're going to have to keep firmly in mind. And I'm going to write, be writing about this fairly soon. AI and video editing on Diginomicus. That should be fun. So you can check it out there. Anyhow, thanks all for joining me and I'll have some more shows later this summer working on some guests, trying to get them prepped up. So it should be fun. All right. Later.